So um, it is uh, a pleasure to have uh, Tristan Buckmaster from Princeton, who will be talking about shock formation and vorticity creation for compressible Euler. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to give a talk. Uh, so I will, um, the, yeah, so I'll be talking about joint work uh, with um, Steve Scholar and uh, uh, Vlad Vicol. And so, so just to introduce the equations we'll be looking at, we're looking at the general equations for compressible oil equations. So this is the non-isentropic equations. We have the equation for conservation of momentum, conservation of mass, and transport of entropy. And we will take the following pressure law, where gamma is greater than one. And associated with this equation, you have uh, the sound speed, and that's the speed at which uh, disturbances propagate. And it's useful to introduce this exponent alpha, which is taken to be uh, uh, gamma minus one on two. Okay, and we'll also look at the isentropic equations. Uh, we take the entropy to be constant, and you just get these two equations. Okay. Let's first look at the uh, 1D case. So in the 1D case, uh, we just have things in terms of time and the one spatial variable x, and we get these uh, two equations. You can write uh, the equation in terms of two Riemann invariants. So you have u plus the multiple of the sound speed, uh, or u minus the uh, multiple of the sound speed. And if you do this, then you uh, turn the equation into a transport equation. So if you write down the following wave speeds, so u plus rho to the alpha, u minus rho to the alpha, then the equations above reduce to these two transport equations. Okay, and um, if you take, say, uh, z equal to be zero, then the, the, you, the first equation after rescaling is just Burgers' equation. So in particular, the 1D case, or that 1D isentropic case is particularly simple in that you can study it in these two variables and you can use method of characteristics um, to study different properties of the solutions. So, Here's an example of a shock forming uh, in for 1D uh, Euler. So this is the velocity, and you see the gradient is going to infinity, and then a shock forms. So in this talk, I'll just be talking about the formation and not the development of the shock. So the shock development is the time after the singularity. The shock formation is the time before the singularity. Okay, so this is a, a shock in for Euler. And what this was a stable shock, and what I mean by stable shock is that if you zoom in on it, and I'll go into more details uh, later, then um, if you zoom on it, zoom in on this shock, then it looks the same. And you have to zoom in on the in the right way. In particular, it will look like a self-similar shock for Burgers. So this is a uh, self-similar shock for Burgers. Okay, and so a singularity occurs in this case at x equals zero. And so what I what I mean by a self-similar solution, I mean that if you rescale rescale it appropriately, um, space uh, in terms of time, then the the solution looks the same. Okay. So, so a little bit about the history of um, shocks and singularities. So, Lux in '64 proved uh, that in 1D, um, for solutions which are C1, that the 
given that the slope is like one over epsilon, then a singularity occurs in order epsilon time. Um, he used Riemann, the Riemann variables that I uh, discussed before, and the proof works by proof of by contradiction. He proves that something must go wrong. Uh, extensions were given by uh, Jan, Liu, Klenemann, Maida, and Maida. A pr more precise description of the singularity was given by uh, Lebeau, and uh, this is not quite for Euler, but for for conservation laws and Kong for, uh, for conservation laws, which include Euler. And in this, they have a pre uh, precise classification of the 1D shock. Um, and they, they also uh, can actually go further and, and look at the development, uh, so the development of the shock after the singularity. So it's a more difficult situation in higher dimensions. So Jan proved uh, the, a breakdown of C3 solutions uh, to a 3D wave equation with uh, quadratic nonlinearities, uh, for which some null condition fails. So Deros in 85 proved the first result in terms of singularities for Euler. Uh, and, and this is, again, it's a proof by contradiction. So you, you prove that a, a singularity must occur. Um, and you have a good guess at what happens, but there's no, it's still a proof by contradiction, so you, you cannot say that it's a shock. You can't classify what type of singularity it is. Okay, I think maybe this face is okay. So this is an example of, oh, this is an example of like, Incredibly difficult behavior, that, uh, complicated behavior that a um, uh, 2D Euler can have. In particular, I want you to take note of this is, you can see a uh, azimuthal shock occurring, and this will be relevant later in the talk. But there's all sorts of things happening here, and I'm not going to prove all these things. Um, and of course, there's boundary, which makes it even more difficult. Okay. Uh, so Yin in 04 proved that uh, for 3D Euler under radial symmetry, you can have a precise uh, description of the singularity and shock development. So this is a one dimensional problem. Um, uh, unlike the, yeah, what's going to proceed, but, but in this case, you have, uh, you have everything. Uh, so Alanak gave a price. Uh, precise description of singularities uh, for 2D quasi linear wave equations. And then uh, Chris Dulu was the first to prove um, uh, that shocks form out of truly uh, high dimensional initial data, so without the symmetry. So he first proved it in the case, the relativistic setting, and then with Miao. Um, proved it in the non-relativistic setting. And they also started with small data, but in particular, they, they, they considered irrotational flow, which I'll talk about later, which is somewhat unphysical, but, um, but sim simplifies the equations and it becomes a quasi-linear wave equation. I'll talk about that later. So Luke and Speck in 18, um, so in uh, built on Chrisou's work, and considered the 2D Euler equations with non-trivial vorticity and also showed that a shock forms. So in, in all these cases, they show a shock forms, but it's it's not as quite precise as say these results where they uh, really describe what type of singularity occurs. And in this particular case, they can actually go into the development. Okay. For, uh, so yeah, for as I mentioned, for irrotational flow, the oil equation is the two D uh, order, the second order uh, quasi linear wave equation. And in particular, you have sound waves but no vorticity waves to interact with, and that makes the the system much simpler. Uh, Christopher Lou and Eve Bork classifies different types of shocks that could occur. 
um, stable and stable shocks, but they, he doesn't prove um, uh, that definitively, given certain initial data, that a, a certain singularity occurs. Um, in and this is actually will be important in the future because if you want to study the development problem, it's very important to have very precise information about the singularity. So in 2D, um, I'll mention this later, but specific vorticity is uh, transported. Uh, the problem is slightly more difficult in 3D where vorticity is transported and stretched, um, which, uh, which was yeah, one of the big differences between 2D and 3D, uh, which, which I'll discuss later. Now there's other types of singularities recently um, uh, or uh, recently found in terms of, uh, okay, th these were known in terms of the, uh, these types of singularities were known in the, in the case of non-smooth initial data, but in terms of starting with smooth initial data, which causes a singularity, um, the, uh, there was a great result by Mel, Raphael, Rondiansky, and Sefto, where they uh, proved the, the first uh, result in terms of smooth initial data that led to an implosion, which is a completely different type of singularity. In the, in the implosion, the density and the velocity go to infinity, whereas in the shock, they stay bounded. Just the gradients go to infinity. Okay. Our objective is to find an open set of initial data, uh, which leads to a generic shock profile. And I'll say what that means in the case of high dimensions. Uh, I want to precisely specify the time, location, curvature, and regularity of the first singularity uh, shock. And, and I will also specify the self-similar profile which is formed. Uh, and we also want to consider the full non-isentropic dynamics. So in this case, you have sound waves, you have entropy waves, and you have uh, uh, vorticity waves. And you can also, in this case, you have that, you can start with, you can say, start with the uh, rotational setting uh, in the full Euler system. And, in, and you can, sound waves can interact with the entropy waves to create vorticity. Uh, so you can leave the irritational setting instantaneously in, in, for this non, full non-isentropic dynamics. Um, and again, even if you're interested in isentropic dynamics, uh, it's very important to study non-isentropic dynamics uh, for in the future, because if you want to study say, the development problem, after a shock forms, uh, entropy is created. So even if you yeah, start with an isentropic solution to begin with, after the singularity, it becomes non-isentropic. So uh, what do I mean by stable shock formation? So I want to define a set of initial data, and it's an open set of initial data. Uh, and from this initial data, one has to infer the geometry of the shock set. So whether that's going to be a point, multiple points, a line, a surface, uh, the precise regularity um, at the blow up and, and the profile. You have to be able to compute the space time location, the singularity, and it should be stable in the sense that uh, any generic perturbation leads to the same, the same type of shock forming. Okay. And this is, this is by the fact that you you are defining an open set of initial data within your appropriate topology. Okay, so this is an example of a, uh, a azimuth or shock. So before we studied the full uh, the full Euler equations uh, without symmetry, we first wanted to study a simpler setting where you had vorticity interaction, but it's problem is essentially 1D. So we studied azimuthal shocks. So there's a lot of literature about radial set shocks, but in the radial setting, you don't have vorticity. Uh, so with, the nice thing about the azimuthal setting is that you can, you can have non-trivial vorticity. And so this is an example of a shock forming um, at this point here. 
And what's nice is that, you know, we prove that this video actually happens. So this is a video of a, a shock forming and we prove exactly what this video shows. Okay. So what do I mean by azimuthal shocks? Uh, so we will consider the following symmetry. So the solution will only depend on the angle and time. And this symmetry will be preserved under the flow. Uh, we have Riemann invariance associated uh, to this, this problem. Um, w and Z are given uh, by this. And if you write this, then you get the following equations. Okay. And so the main thing to keep in mind is these blue terms here. Um, so if you somehow you know, squint your eyes, uh, like, I don't know if you ever had, when, when I was a child, we had, you know, these magic, uh, what is it, magic eye books where you see a 3D picture uh, within a, a pattern. So if you look at, squint your eyes um, and look at this for a while, then you see the Burgers equation and, and nothing else here is relevant. So the Burgers equation being these blue terms. Uh, and so the, the whole, the hard part of the analysis is, is showing that if you zoom in on the singularity, uh, then the, then you just see a Burgers type, uh, shock form. And then you have to bound the rest of the terms. So let's make this more precise. So what we, uh, show is that we start with C4 initial data um, and we start with a slope of, of 1 over epsilon and we assume that the the so A is so W and Z are the two Riemann invariants and A is the uh, radial direction uh, speed direction so we assume that one Riemann invariant and the uh, other the the radial direction is is bound has some bound and we and uh, what we so and we have an open set of initial data so we basically take the this uh, the first ring of variant variant to be close uh, in some sense to the stable uh, Burgers shock. And what we show is that the, that uh, a shock forms at some blow up time and this uh, approximately at time zero, um, that these, uh, the, the C1, C, the C1 drew, uh, uh, norms of A and Z remain bounded and the L infinity norm of W remains bounded. But at, at the singularity, W is C one third, and no better. Um, there, and you, there exists a single angle at which the shock forms. Nothing else goes wrong. Everywhere else, the solution is smooth, uh, and we can have non-trivial vorticity at this point of blow up. Now, if you're interested in this in this work, this is a good paper to start with because this is where we sort of build, start to build a machinery that we used in our later papers. So uh, we we built a sort of a self similar modulated self similar analysis, uh, which of course there's a lot of papers out there where, where modulated self similar analysis is used, but we have a different flavor in the sense that we rely on geometric information of the solution and our self similar analysis uses a lot of transport arguments, unlike previous work in self similar analysis, which is, tends to, to be about, um, you know, linear stability, uh, uh, linear stability of a, of a linearized operator, which is different than the, um, the type of arguments that we do here. And I'll, I'll talk about that. So we don't use sort of spectral information of, of a luminous operator in particular. 
So let's consider the full 3D compressible oil equations. So this is the same equations I introduced in the first slide. And this is uh, one thing is nice is to rewrite this equation in terms of the sound speed. Because if you rewrite the t this in terms of sound speed, then the, the two equations uh, uh, have similar, you know, similar form. Okay, and so this is the form it takes. So you have you have uh, u is transported by u, sound speed is transported by u, and you have these extra terms here, and k, which is the entropy, is just transported. Now the vorticity is the curl of u. The specific vorticity is a much more useful um, uh, quantity. The specific vorticity is the vorticity divided by rho. And the equation for the specific vorticity is the following. So in the case of uh, in the case of isentropic Euler, then this term is zero, and you just get the typical uh, you know transport stretching equation with the velocity e. And this term, of course, in 2D would vanish. In 3D, it, it, uh, it remains there. And it'll be, you know, it, it, these, these terms are difficult to deal with in the sense that they will, be, they will become infinite at the time of, of uh, the singularity. And if you also, if you just integrate the L infinity norm of these quantities, they, that also is not integrable. So you really need to use uh, more structure to be able to handle these extra terms here. So the right-hand side, which can be written as follows, uh, is called the baroclinic torque. And as you can see, it's from the misalignment of the pressure and, and density gradients. And what can happen is that you can start from a irritational solution and this baroclinic Torque can instantaneously create vorticity. So this is a this this is an example where um, yeah you, you, for the full the full Euler system there's really little point in that. So f physically you you, sh you shouldn't restrict yourself to uh, irritational data. So the uh, the, so what we show is in uh, in the shocks that will form, the vorticity will remain bounded and non-trivial at the shock. It's a, I mean, it's a local equation, so it doesn't matter what the vorticity is away from the singularity. But it's important that it will be non-trivial at the at the at the shock, uh, and this will be the case even though this forcing term will blow up at the shock. So how do we go about proving this? So the, the hard part is to reformulate uh, how we look at the equations in order to, you know, uh, to see Bergen's. So you see, how, how do you squint your eyes in such a way that you only see the Bergen's equation? Uh, so, how we do this is, as I said, we're going to use modulated uh, self similar variables. So, we will switch from our regular variables to these modulated self similar space time variables, yf. Uh, and we will also have to introduce new variables instead of using u and sigma, so the velocity and the sound speed and the entropy, we will need two Riemann invariants, and a, and a will be a transversal direction, uh, which I'll talk about later, transversal velocity to the, to the singularity, uh, and k is the self-similar uh, entropy. So before I describe the transformation uh, to write these equations in these variables, 
let me just tell you what we're looking to find. So I want to find a solution that will asymptotically look like a stationary solution to the 3D self-similar um, Burgers equation. So this is a 3D self-similar Burgers equation. I'll make this a little bit more precise on the next slide. Let me just move my face out of the way. Okay, um, so it will be important that the uh, Hessian matrix of the of the derivative in the y1 direction will be strictly positive definite, and this will ensure the stability of the singularity, and this will come up later. Okay, and the the this 3D self-similar burgers can be written in terms of the 1D self-similar burgers solution. Okay, let me just show you a video of what this looks like. So this is the 3D self similar burgers. I'm going to use it. It's a short video, but it's just causing a shock at this at the origin here. Okay. And this is a video of so in this case the one main difference is that we've kind of cut things off at infinity so that it has finite energy. And because we have stability, that you can do such things. So here's the singularity occurring at zero, and this, I think this goes actually a little bit past the singularity as well. Okay, and a clearer side on view, the same thing. So singularity occurs here, and this goes past the singularity. This is actually the development stage. So we don't describe this uh, for the moment. So, as I said, the main difficulty, oh, well, there's a lot of difficulties to do with higher dimensions. And let, so let's discuss this. Uh, the first difficulty is just that uh, in higher dimensions, the Euler equation satisfies a lot of symmetries. And you have to modulate these symmetries out in order that you can zoom in on um, and see a particular self-similar solution to the Burgess equations. So uh, we want to dynamically ensure that our, our actual uh, Riemann invariant, which I haven't defined yet, will look like the Burgess solution. How do we do that? Uh, well, we will need uh, 10 dynamic constraints. The most important thing about the solution is, is its sort of Taylor series at the singularity. And we'll have to control the low order terms in the Taylor series, and everything else will be stable. And I'll describe why that's the case later. But in particular, we need to control um, W at zero, it, its gradient at zero, and the Hessian at zero. Okay, And this corresponds to 10 dynamic constraints. So how do I impose this? Well, I need to uh, use the symmetries of the equation. So if, by modulating out symmetries of the equation itself, um, or the problem, uh, I will be able to uh, constrain these, uh, th this, second order Taylor uh, series expansion at zero. So there'll be the speed of the shock, the time the shock occurs, the location of the shock, the direction of the shock, and the most difficult constraint of them all that took us a long time to figure out is the curvature of the shock front. So these are all the things um, uh, where which we'll have to modulate in order to, uh, to, to for us to uh, impose these ten dynamic constraints. And if you can, if you compare this to the one D problem, in the one D problem you have the speed of the shock, which is one constraint, the time the shock occurs, which is one constraint, and the location of the shock which, uh, occurs, which is one constraint. So you have three constraints. Uh, in particular, these last two are do not appear at all. 
Okay. And so this is one thing that makes the problem very messy and very difficult. Okay. Um, and I'll talk about other difficulties in a second, difficulties in a second, but um, once, so, so we will use self-similar coordinates uh, and variables uh, which are dynamically modulated in order to ensure these constraints, okay? And they're modulated in terms of these properties. Uh, and such self-similar analysis is, is is uh, you know it, there's this huge literature, you know, a lot of it um, by Mel, Mel, Raphael, Mel Zag. I mean, there's a, a, a thousand references. But one thing to keep in mind is the, the type of self-similar analysis that we'll do is of a different flavor, um, and and the the main difference is that it will really use the fact that we're dealing with a fluids equation when the fluids equation everything is transported and you want to use that transport and geometric structure and this is very kind of different than the literature which is uh more it more relies on on, on looking at, at spectral properties of a linearized operator which is kind of an abstract generic thing that works um but doesn't uh, really use, uh, it, it's useful in, in an equation like this where you have so much, so much structure to really use that structure. So I'll talk about that in a second. So let me, uh, okay. So first of all, we rescale time. Uh, this is just to remove a constant. That's, this is kind of irrelevant, this rescaling of time. We shift and ro uh, rotate uh, their coordinates, and this is to um, so we have the location and direction of the shock. So this is five constraints. So shifting and rotating, and then you end up with the following equations, and this is the equation for the specific vorticity. Uh, now we want to deal with the curvature of the shock front. Um, so we parameterize this curvature uh, in terms of some. Uh, we have we introduce the modulation function or what is to, to remove this curvature, uh, which is going to be phi, and these um, these Greek letters are only in uh, the transverse direction, the, 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 the related to the transverse directions of the shock, not in the direction of the shock. Okay, so we we introduce this function phi, which depends on time, and with this we can introduce a, a normal direction of the uh, the shock, uh, which will be pointing in the e1 direction at uh, uh, if you follow the singularity forming, and then it, this this n will become curved uh, in uh, it would be become curved later, uh, and we want to remove this. The point of the point is to use this to remove this curvature of the, the actual shock front. So we have the associated with the normal direction. You have two tangent vectors, which we call t two and t three. And we have this Jacobian, which is approximately one. Uh, we introduce what we call the sheep shear transformation, which is a terrible in joke, um, in order to remove this curvature. So we have this variable x1 and uh, x1, and what we do is we uh, we just sort of subtract off this curvature given by this form here. Uh, and with that, we get messier and messier equations. Okay, so, so far I've used the location of the shock, the direction of the shock, and the curvature of the shock. So now I have to deal with the speed of the shock and the time of the shock. Okay, so now we introduce what uh, the Riemann variables. Now the big difference between 1D 
and uh, higher dimensions is that there's no canonical definition of what the Riemann variables are. So in 1D, you know that the singularity occurs in one direction, and so you can just define the Riemann variables that way. In higher dimensions, you have to know uh, in which direction the shock is occurring uh, in order to uh, define the Riemann variables. So the nice thing about the Riemann variables, remember, in 1D is it transforms the Euler equations into transport equations. So you have no loss of derivative on the right-hand side. This does not happen in higher dimensions. Uh, you can only remove the derivatives uh, from the right-hand side uh, in one particular direction. And so you want to pick the direction which is which the singularity, the gradient uh, where the slope gradient of infinity occurs. Okay, and so that's why we use this normal direction here, n. So it's u dot n uh, sigma, and and then this, and now we can have the two Riemann variables in the direction of the the shock occurring. And remember, I talked about some a, which is in the transverse direction. So this is in the perpendicular direction to this, to the normal n. Okay, so in the two tangential directions. Okay, so this, uh, so we first do this, so this is the Riemann variables, and now we introduce our self-similar time, so uh, which we define to be log uh, tau t minus t, and so tau parameterizes when the singularity occurs. So instead of saying the singularity occurring at time zero, it, in these new variables, they will occur at time infinity. Okay, and so, and then we introduce self-similar spatial variables, where we rescale in terms of when the singularity occurs, and we end up writing uh, W, Z, and A in terms of these self-similar capital W, capital Z, and capital A. And we, we renormalize uh, W, and we also introduce uh, this kappa, which says which parameterizes the speed of the of the shock uh, front so the speed the velocity uh, at which the shock is occurring okay and and so and this removes one more variable so these are the last two variables that we removed uh, that we had left and th this removes those two last variables okay so let's so we're now looking at a asymptotic self-similar blow-up. So why you should think of y as being approximately e to the three on two s x. S will go to infinity as t goes to uh, t star. So so in particular, you're zooming in on the singularity. E to the power s is roughly one over the uh, the time of the singularity minus t. Uh, so we have W is, is, as I said, given by this formula here, and the, the derivative of W is given by uh, this formula here. So this is the X1 derivative, it should be, and the Y1 derivative. And we, what we will expect is that W will converge to a stationary solution of the self-similar Berger's equation. So the singularity will blow up like E to the S or one over T star minus T. And the gradient will blow up that way. So as S goes to infinity, we will have asymptotically in cell similar blow up. That doesn't mean globally, it means as you zoom in to the shock, uh, it will converge to a stationary solution to the 3D Berger's equation. And such solutions can be, um, uh, is a finite family. There's a finite family of such solutions. Okay. And so, and this, and those solutions will be the, will be the self-similar profile, which the singularity occurs. So as uh, T becomes close to the, Singularity, we have that the, the derivative of w will blow up like one over t 
t star minus t. Okay. Now, if we introduce all these coordinate transformations, this is the horrible formulas we get. And I've hidden much of the disastrous mess in notation by introducing these betters and um, these GWs, which I haven't defined. Um, but th this is sort of the formula you get. But in particular, if you squint, you see self similar burgers. So these terms, and if you treat J being one and beta tau being one, and this term and this term combine to be self similar burgers, oh, sorry, and including this term as well. Okay. And then you ignore everything else. We also need the equations, a self similar version of the velocity and sound speed. And that's useful because uh, we'll still need to do energy estimates. The reason we have to do energy estimates is, unfortunately, for 3D Euler, as I described, the Riemann variables do not uh, hide the loss of derivative. They don't remove the loss of derivative, so you have a loss of derivative in the tangential directions. And so you have to do some energy estimate argument in order to close the whole system. And, and it's easier to do the energy estimate arguments in the original uh, velocity and sound speed variables, or the self-similar version of them. So we introduce that. And it's what it's in, what will be very important is that, as I said, as in the previous theorems uh, that I've stated, that secondary var variable and the tangential velocities, their gradients will remain bounded. And the only reason this occurs is because of the disagreement in the transport velocities. Uh, and in particular, the, the transport velocity, the difference between this and this will be approximately e to s on two. Um, and this will be, this will make the difference in terms of the, uh, of why they, they remain bounded. And I'll explain that. Uh, in this toy problem. So let's consider the following toy problem where you have the Burgers equation and you have um, some extra passive scalar. Okay. Now, the only difference, uh, so if I had kept this as just um, dt, z, w, dx, z, then, uh, then the, the singularity z will probably occur just, just like the singularity w. But I've added this minus three, and it really doesn't matter what it, I could have put one here, but it was just for the, just so things look nice. Uh, so if you put this minus three, then the, uh, the z, the c1 norm of z will actually remain bounded uh, for a self similar uh, shock of burgers. Um, so I think this is a, a good little toy problem, and it's, it's one that I always joke about giving during a general examination, um, but I've been told it uh, would be mean to give this as a general exam. But it, it's actually kind of easy to, it's very easy to, to show why this is the case. So if we take the derivatives, uh, then we get the following equations, and you get the regular uh, uh, quadratic term which causes a singularity in burgers. And you also have this quadratic term here that looks like just as bad as the quadratic term here. And so the question is why does the derivative z not blow up? So let's, the easiest thing is to write this in self similar variables. So we assume that the singularity happens at the origin and we assume that w is zero at the origin. And so if that's the case, then uh, we write these variables like this, and we end up with these self-similar equations. So the main, I, I'm going to, just as a preference, I, I, I'm going to rescale w, but I'm not going to rescale z. Okay, so the one big thing to notice is the different transport velocities. Uh, you have this extra term 3 to the e to the s on 2. Okay, as, as a in the transport. And this is what I was saying before, that this is the main reason why the derivatives of Z and A don't blow up. 
Okay, so you introduce this extra term here. And uh, so if you did the silly thing and you just wanted to bound this and uh, bound this, then what you do is you do a Gronwell inequality and you bound everything on the right hand side in terms of the L infinity norm at the right hand side, but then you would fail. You know, this is not integrable. So you have to do something more clever. Okay, so you have to use the actual trajectories. So if you, with the trajectories that are given here, this, this trajectory here, if you start at, uh, to the right of e to the s on 2, then the tra trajectory will run off to infinity. If you start with the trajectory to the left of e to the s on 2, then it'll take order 1 time to get to 0, and then it will run off to infinity. Uh, so the only tra trajectory that can uh, hit the singularity is one that stays at e to the s on 2. And this may see, seem kind of intuitive because it's going away from the origin, so how could it you know, hit the singularity which occurs at the origin? Well, the singularity occurs, the origin in the original variables, the, the x variables. Now, if you rescale e to the s on 2, uh, if you, uh, into the original variables, you get e to the minus s. So this is a trajectory that hits the origin. Okay. So this is the main trajectory to, to keep in account. This is the only possible trajectory that could blow up. So let's consider this particular trajectory. So uh, let's give it, so let's write the equation uh, for phi. Then, and let's write the equation for the derivative of z, which is in self similar coordinates e to the 3s on 2 dyz. So you get these equations like this. Okay, and so the important equations are given the important equation is given here and then if we flow it by this map phi then we get the transport term drops out and we just have to bound uh this uh sorry we just have to bound this term we do a Gronwell argument so we just have to bound dy y of uh w along this tra trajectory uh phi and if that is integrable, then we're done. So we this is bounded if we if this is bounded. Okay. But if you know what this you know the structure of the self-similar uh, solution, then w, then w decays like one plus y squared uh, to the power of minus one third. So if you plug this estimate into here, you end up with uh, integrating. Uh, uh, integrating this, uh, uh, which is clearly integrable. You know, it's, it's e to the s on 3. Okay, so you get something roughly e to the s on minus s on 3, uh, which is like, uh, in our language, it's f sum to one third. So this is integrable. So the whole point is that the, you have different trajectories. So it's very important that the trajectory is not just sticky with the trajectory of w, but it's actually going, it has a different one, and, and this is what causes the derivative to remain bounded. Um, and so I'm running out of time, so I'll just give uh, uh, just a minute or two, is that okay, um, to finish up. So another key uh, observation is I said that the most important thing was to bound the Taylor series at the origin. Um, and that's where the stability comes in. Uh, and the reason to see this is that in self similar coordinates, the more derivatives you take, the better things become. Okay, this may seem kind of intuitive, but the reason for it is that the more derivatives you take, uh, when the derivatives hit this velocity, uh, you get damping terms. And the more derivatives you take, you get a rough a damping term, which is roughly minus 1 plus gamma 1. Okay, It's a bit more complicated than this, but... Uh, sorry, you get this damping term here, and this is a... So this is just some bound. Okay, so you get all these damping terms here, 
uh, and this this dominate this term here uh, uh, as long as the you take enough derivatives. So the more derivatives you take, uh, the more damping you get, and this is where you get the stability. So if you can control the low the low Taylor series uh, expansion at zero, you can control everything. Uh, so the aim is to that you get global bounds for gamma bigger than uh, four or, or bigger, and then you the only thing is to bound the first three uh, derivatives, and you do this by splitting things up into two parts. You do a Taylor series uh, expansion near the origin, and away from the origin, you do transport estimates. You do estimates similar to what I described before. Um, so you do transport estimates. And using these two things, you can bound the low orders, and then you have to close things because of the loss of derivative, and this is done by higher order Sobolev estimates. And a big difficulty in the 3D Euler, as a, especially compared with the 2D Euler, is that you have, um, you have vortex stretching. And so you have to extract a whole lot of geometric uh, information about the vorticity, and this is used to, to, to bound some extra things which could cause you problems. Um, but if you use this, uh, you use similar arguments to I have before and, and clever geometric decompositions of vorticity, you can bound the vorticity. And the same goes for the entropy. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah. So this is uh, uh, what our results. So there's two papers, one for the isentropic and one for the non-isentropic. And we show that the, the dominant Riemann variable, which I described before, behaves like the, uh, the self-similar Burgers equation. We have, uh, in particular, it converges asymptotically to a a stationary solution to the Sussman Burgers equation. Uh, we have bounds on the velocity, density, entropy, vort vorticity, and we stay away from vacuum. And we have bounds on the tangential derivatives of everything. Um, and, but the normal derivative of the main, of the first Riemann variable blows up. And it blows up in the precise way you end up with a C one third cusp uh, type singularity. Um, and you also have very good control on the Lagrangian trajectories, uh, which you have you end up having still bounds on the on the um, on the, uh, the the gradient of the of the Lagrangian trajectories, which is useful in, in bounding things like the uh, the vorticity and entropy. And finally, you can create uh, vorticity uh, from irrotational data, as long as you have non-trivial entropy. Uh, and I will leave it here. And this is a video of where we would like to go next, which is shock development. So we've described the whole picture up to the first singularity occurring, but now we would like to describe uh, what happens after the first singularity occurs. Okay, I'm sorry for going over time. Okay, thank you. So if uh, anybody has questions, uh, you can go ahead and mute yourself and ask. So, um, uh, so Tristan, if you have uh, just Berger's equation, so mm -hmm. if you add some uh, low order diffusion term, then the uh, blow up uh, singularity that survives, right? So if you now add some low order diffusion to the whole flaming mass that you guys created here, uh, does that same happen? Yes, it makes life very difficult in the sense that uh, I, it, Depends. It depends what you yeah type of diff if it's just a regular sort of. I, it depends if it's a non-local diffusion that makes life messy, but it doesn't do anything. In, in yeah. yeah, it works. Um. So that was a there was a. Um. There, yeah, there was a 
related project uh so that I talked to a, um, a student of Giuliano Stefilani, um, who uh, had a paper on the Burgers Hilbert equation, which is where you put a Reese operator on the right hand side, and it showed that it does what you expect it should do. Um, so that's an example of a non local. Uh, non so th these, th this, this work works in the case where you have non local. Uh, non-local behavior as long as it's subdominant. Um, so, so it, the, the kind of techniques that we have is um, very useful in the case where the local transport behavior is the dominant behavior. Right, and so it would be it would be the same like if your Laplacian has power less than one half, then something. exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, if it's less than one half, yeah, I think it's the critical one. Uh, it's, it's still an interesting problem um, to look at uh, in terms of. So uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that you know you don't just have the stable singularity. Uh, there's there's unstable singularities of Burgers as well. So where um, so the stable singularity is sort of characterized by the uh, by the derivative at the origin being negative. The second derivative being zero, and the third derivative being, um, say, positive. And so this is a stable singularity, and there's unstable singularities where the uh, higher order odd uh, odd derivatives are positive, and the rest of them in between are zero. And so we studied this problem in the case of the azimuthal symmetry with um, Samir Aya. Um, and showed that you can you can you can see those singularities as well uh, in the case of Euler. So you can we we created a Newton scheme that zooms in on these type of singularities. Uh, and so in the case that you were describing before, you know it may be interesting to know what type of Burger singularities survive. I mean, it should be kind of by scaling it should be easy to figure out what should survive, um, but it'd be good to characterize what type of singularities uh, uh, survive given the, the, the power of the, of the, dis of the dissipation. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, any, any other questions? Um, Andrew, can I ask a question? Me? Oh, no, no, can I ask a question? Yeah, 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 quite <laughs> quite. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, my question is: uh, Is it true that for compressible Eulers, uh, one of the main goals is to categorize like all kinds of singularities? Uh, also, like uh, what kind of singularities are considered to be physical, or they actually there's no, not not that much difference between physical singularity and a mathematical singularity? So, uh, yeah, one. So one, yeah, it it depends on your. Who you speak to, but so, uh, but there, there's all sorts of singularities that can uh, occur. Um, as I said, there's these implosions. Uh, one thing that some people make that distinction, so a mathematical versus a physical singularity, where they make the distinction between stability. So if if you take uh, initial data, like an open set of initial data that leads to particular singularity, then you could say it's physical because uh, you could possibly see that singularity occur. And then you could characterize uh, other types of singularities being unphysical in the sense that they're unstable. So uh, you know, something else would occur, likely occur before they would occur. And, and, and then uh, I, I don't know if it's a good way to, to describe things, but so if you take that, but if you take that as a sort of way of distinguishing them, so the implosion type results uh, are, are likely unstable. <laughs> it's, it's most likely unstable. It's uh, the, I mean, they're certainly unstable in the sense that they impose a radial symmetry, so it's a 1D problem. Um, and, but they, uh, I can't definitively say they're unstable in the sense that there's no proof that they're unstable. It's not like, uh, the Burgers one where you know that you perturb it a little bit and another one occurs. What they prove is that they 
they prove that the singularities occur with uh, outside a finite dimensional uh, manifold of uh, uh, co-dimensional space, um, which is, you know, so which means it's unstable and it could be a very high dimension. They, the, the argument doesn't, that they have doesn't uh, specify the exact dimension. So, uh, but yeah, but um, such solutions are still physical in the sense that even if they're unstable, you know, they occur up to a point and then something else happens. Um, so, and, but I think it's very interesting to uh, characterize all types of singularities that occur. So the, the shocks are the natural ones because if you, you know, slow a compressible flow, the type of singularity you see are shocks. <laughs> They're the first ones you see. There's all sorts, all sorts of other singularities that occur, but they usually occur after the first shock. Um, and, uh, but, and, but it's a in, incredibly interesting problem to characterize them all. Um, but I, I don't know if you can characterize them all, but to find new ones. And so that's why it was a big result, this, this result of, uh, um, by Merle, Raphael, uh, uh, Rodiansky, and Sefto, where they found a different type of singularity. Uh, I mean, yeah, such the type of analysis they were doing was already done in, in the physics literature, but it was a different type of singularity that they observed in the physical literature in the sense that a shock had already formed. So the implosions that are studied in the, in the physical literature is the shock forms and then the implosion happens. They found a different type of singularity where the shock doesn't occur first, but the singularity occurs by, via the implosion. So it's a very interesting result. I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, um, anyone else wants to ask a question? If not, uh, then let's uh, thank Tristan again. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. much. <laughs> it was a very nice talk. Thank uh, you. And uh, <laughs> well, uh, good luck. Uh,